Good afternoon. My name is Paul Fletcher. I'm a periodontist, and the topic of my, comp uh, my presentation today is the diagnosis and treatment of inflammatory peri-implant disease. Whether you're placing implants, restoring implants, or placing and restoring implants, this is a really important and relevant topic, and one that's uh, very, very controversial in dentistry today. And it's something that you should really have an understanding of. There are some dentists that feel peri-implant disease is a minor inconvenience, and they don't really see it in their practice, while others feel that it's becoming more and more relevant and prevalent and is a major problem. I personally feel we have a problem. I currently teach in the postgraduate department at Columbia University. I teach periodontics and implant dentistry. And I have to tell you, hardly a week goes by when some student doesn't approach me with a problem with a case of peri-implant disease. I also practice in a group specialty practice, an implant cosmetic group specialty practice. And I partner with Dennis Tarnow. Dennis is the uh, former chairman of the Department of Implant Dentistry at New York University, is currently director of implant dentistry at Columbia University. Steve Chu runs the cosmetic and aesthetic programs at NYU and Columbia. John Zamzuk is uh, a past uh, president of the uh, New York Academy of, uh, of Prosthodontics. Um, Rich Smith is dual trained in both implants and prosthetics. Marion Brown is the first woman to pass the prosthetic boards in, in New York State. Guido Sonichiero is uh, from Argentina. He's trained in both implant dentistry and oral surgery and prosthetics. And Mark Hockman is a periodontist and orthodontist. And between all of us in the office, I have to tell you at this point in time, approximately 40%, 40 to 50% of the new patients that we see in pr our practice are due to implant-related problems. Now, not all peri-implant disease, but implant-related problems. And as the periodontist, I'm the person for, responsible for dealing with most of the problems that I see with peri-implant disease. 25 years ago, I used to be saying to, in 1988, Mrs. Jones, implants are great, they don't decay, and they don't get periodontal disease. At this point in time, I have to say, Mrs. Jones, implants are great, they don't decay, but they can get peri-implant disease. And this is a very important distinction. I mean, I think implants are wonderful, but we are starting to see issues, and it's most important that we understand how to treat these issues. And essentially, if you understand with periodontal disease, with periodontal disease, an individual will get their permanent teeth by the time they're 12 to 15 or 18 years old. And we really don't see periodontal disease until they're in their 40s or 50s, 25, 35 years later. Well, with dental implants, what we're starting to see is that we put the implants in, and now that we're going out 10, 15, 20, 25 years, we're starting to see more problems than we didn't, that we didn't see initially. Now, how did we get to this place? Well, from a historical perspective, I think we've been lulled into complacency by the original Branamark research from the 1980s and 1990s, where they originally were saying periodontal indices, that's like bleeding upon probing and, and probing depths and pocket depths, periodontal indices when applied to the peri-implant mucosa may be of little clinical significance when measuring the success or failure of osseointegrated implants. And in other words, they were saying bleeding wasn't particularly significantly diagnostic and periodontal pocket depth wasn't specific, uh, specifically diagnostic. They also said Adele and Leckham, also from the Branamark group, peri-implant disease is rare. Attached gingiva is only needed if the area was inflamed. And at the time, they were telling us, you don't even really have to probe these implants. And to this day, there are some dentists that feel implants shouldn't be probed. But we started to see some problems. You have to remember, these were all around smooth surface implants. And when we started to see some problems is when we started using rough surface implants, which is where we are today. And there are certainly benefits to rough surface implants. So rougher surface implants, what Block saw back in 1996, is significantly more peri-implant disease without keratinized tissue. So this is when we just started to see some problems. 
Now, we do have a problem from my perspective because the research is showing that as the number of implants that have been placed increases and the number of years implants have been in place increases, the incidence of periodontal disease is increasing and the prevalence of periodontal disease is increasing. But these numbers that you see in the research are all over the place. For instance, bleeding upon probing, which mucositis at 10 years, 79% of patients having implants, but 50 to 90% of implants. Well, that's a big span. And notice, some of the studies talk about patients, some of the studies talk about the implants having problems. And with peri-implantitis, anywhere from 28 to 56% of patients and 12 to 43% of implants. So what's the reason for such a spread? Well, some of the researchers are looking at patients. They feel they're the more important thing, uh, important um, statistic or to look at, basically, because a patient has, if they have multiple implants, those implants are subject to the same bacterial flora in the patient's mouth. The patient has the same predisposition to periodontal disease with all of those numbers of implants. Their home care is the same. And in general, what we're seeing is the studies have shown that one a patient that has one implant with peri-implant disease has a 30% higher chance of having a second implant with periodontal disease than a patient without having periodontal disease. So that's the reason why they think it's important to look at implant, uh, the patients per se. Other dentists feel it's important to count implants. When you take a look at this study over here by, you know, Franzen, Leckel, Yemp, and Berglund in 2005, they looked at 662 patients having 3,413 implants. Now, of those 662 patients, 185 of them had peri-implant disease. 185 of 662 is 28% of the patients. So the statistic is 28% of the patients had one or more implants with progressive bone loss or peri-implant disease. When they looked at the implants, out of the 3,413 implants, only 423 of the 3,413 implants had progressive bone loss. And that's only 12% of the implants. So as you can see, these statistics are very misleading depending upon how you look at the disease process. Other studies are uh, cause confusion also because some people in some of the studies said, well, any implant with bone loss greater than two millimeters is considered peri-implant disease. Others said, well, any uh, implant with greater than three millimeters of bone loss were indicative of peri-implant disease. So we're not always comparing apples and apples, and the statistics are very confusing, but the important thing is if your patient has peri-implant disease, you have a problem and you have a headache. Looking on, let's talk a little bit about implant survival and implant success. With implant survival and implant success, basically, we see statistics and hear statistics that implants are 98% successful. They're not necessarily talking about success. They're talking about 98% survival. So implant survival is often equated with implant success. And it's defined as the implant remaining in the jaw. That's implant survival equated with implant success. Implant success, according to Albrechtson, and the parameters established back in 1986 is the implant is immobile when tested clinically. Vertical bone loss is less than two-tenths of a millimeter after the first year. And 85% of the implant is bone after five years and 80% after 10 years. If we take a look at these implants after 13 years, well, we do have implant survival. The implants have certainly survived, but is this case a success? This case has, this patient has problems and this, these problems need treatment. And that's what we essentially need here. So survival and success are very misleading and very confusing. The idea is this needs treatment. This isn't something that you can just watch and watch and follow. It's going to progress. Let's get some definitions, okay? Mucositis and peri-implantitis. Mucositis is a reversible inflammatory reaction in the soft tissues surrounding a functional, functioning implant. So that's in the soft tissues. While peri-implantitis is a destructive inflammatory reaction 
affecting the soft and hard tissues of an implant in function. So soft and hard tissues. This means bone loss, okay? So mucositis is essentially the equivalent of gingivitis, whereas peri-implantitis is more essentially the equivalent of periodontal disease or periodontitis. Here you can see the soft tissue destruction and besides soft tissue you can see bony destruction. This is peri-implantitis. Let's talk a little bit about the microbiology of peri-implant disease. Also very important for you to understand. Bacteria in peri-implant disease are similar to the bacteria in periodontal disease. But we're starting to see now in the research that they exist in different proportions in peri-implant disease than they do in periodontal disease. The microflora present prior to implantation determines the composition composition of the microflora on implants, all right? So essentially, whatever is in that patient's mouth at the time you put the implants in will determine the bacteria or the microbes around the implant. So if that patient has periodontal disease, the bacteria from periodontal disease will be in that patient's mouth when you ultimately put the implant into the patient's mouth. Now also, patients who lost their teeth due to periodontitis have an increased risk of developing peri-implantitis. And this isn't a maybe, this has been shown by multiple, multiple researchers that if the patient had periodontitis, he'll have a greater risk of developing peri-implantitis. This was a patient in our practice. Take a look, in 1999, this tooth was going to be removed because all of the bone was lost. So we took the tooth out, we augmented the bone in that area, we placed an implant, and this is the implant with the restoration in place in the year 2000. If you look in 2004, that implant was still in place in the patient's mouth, and the bone level looked the same as it did in 2000. This patient then went to China, moved to China, we lost him for five years. When he came back in five years, take a look what was happening around that implant all of a sudden. Okay, we started to see bone loss again. And now in 2012, he still hadn't had gotten around to having this treated, and this bone loss had gotten wider and progressed even further. Looking at the histopathology of peri-implant disease, this is the reason why this is occurring. Again, this isn't open to discussion. This has been shown multiple times in multiple studies. The amount and intensity of bone loss is more rapid, okay, around an implant than it is around a tooth. Now that's why we have a problem. Uh, the apical extension of the inflammatory cell uh, infiltrate is more widespread and extended into the alveolar bone around implants. Now the reason for this is, if this is the tooth, and you can take a look here, and this is the bone, and this is our ligament, and this is the epithelial attachment of the junctional epithelium and the connective tissue attachment, you can see around the tooth there are perpendicular connective tissue fibers going into the cementum of the tooth. These perpendicular fibers attach into the tooth itself and act as a barrier. They actually act as a fiber barrier to prevent the bacteria, and this is the bacteria over here, from penetrating down into the bone. At the same time, because it's a periodontal ligament, there are anti-inflammatory cells in the periodontal ligament space, and these anti-inflammatory cells wind up migrating in to this inflammatory cell infiltrate and wind up combating and destroying the bacteria in the infiltrate. So there's almost an encapsulation and pr protective mechanism around the tooth and protecting the bone. Around the implant, because there's no ligament and there are no perpendicular connective tissue fibers attaching into the implant, what happens is you have these circular fibers going around the implant and they're not as resistant to the penetration of the bacteria. The bacteria penetrate faster and more rapidly into the underlying bone. And what you can see here is the amount of intensity of bone loss was more rapid at the implant than two site, 3.2 millimeters at the implant site as opposed to 1.3 millimeters around the, uh, at the, around the uh, tooth. That's pretty significant. And the peri-implant tissues appeared less able to arrest the progressive plaque-associated lesions. And that's been shown repeatedly in the research. 
Now, if you take a look at this particular histological slide, this is Dan Booz's research, and what he's showing essentially, these are connective tissue fibers going towards the implant. And as they get close to the implant, what happens is these connective tissue fibers turn and wind up going circularly around the implant, as opposed to attaching into the implant the way the connective tissue fibers do around the tooth. So, the parallel or circular orientation of the connective tissue fibers may lead to a more rapid spread of inflammation in the peri-implant mucosa. And the self-limiting healing process in periodontal tissues may not be present around implants, which is what we've said and what's been shown in the research. Now, when you take a look at these clinically, I mean, you take a look at the amount of bone loss and the way the bone is lost around an implant, this is a different animal than the way the bone is lost around the tooth. Around the tooth, it's site-specific. So we'll see a, a vertical defect on the mesial of the tooth or on the distal of the tooth, an isolated vertical defect. But around an implant, because of the circular orientation of the connective tissue fibers, that inflammation progresses 360 degrees around an implant and more aggressively than it does around the tooth. Now the rate of peri-implant bone loss is increases in time. In other words, this bone loss isn't linear, it's exponential. So it increases the longer the patient has the disease problem. This is a patient from Columbia University. These implants were originally placed in 2004. We don't have the original x-ray, but in 2007, you can see this, the bone levels in the x-ray are still fine. They're exactly the way we want them to be. In 2009, the patient is beginning to have a problem. But between 2009 and 2011, look how rapidly that problem progressed. So once it starts, it starts to progress rapidly, as the research shows. Now this is a patient from my office. And I have to tell you, we got burnt with this patient. Take a look at these x-rays. These implants were originally placed in 2000. Originally placed in 2000, patient originally had the x-rays. In 2008, the patient went on a calcium channel blocker, cardizam, procardia. She started to have heart problems. We put her on, a, uh, her physician put her on a calcium channel blocker. The gingiva started to hypertrophy, as it can with calcium channel blockers. We kept trying to maintain her. 2008, she went on them. We took x-rays sequentially. In 2011, take a look at these x-rays. The bone level is pretty good. The ginger was puffy and swollen and inflamed. We were maintaining her, and we just kept maintaining her because the ginger, because the bone levels maintained. But look what happened between 2011 and 2012 in terms of the amount of rapid bone loss that occurred in response to this type of peri-implant disease. Take a look from here to here. I mean, that's a huge amount of bone loss. And we wound up getting burnt because we didn't intercede earlier when we saw this starting to happen. So again, this, when it starts to increase, can increase very rapidly. So once the threads are exposed, you can't, or involved, you, and have lost bone, you can't just watch and wait and say, we'll try to maintain it. It doesn't work that way around implants. Mucositis and peri-implantitis. The growth of oral biofilms is facilitated by the screw-shaped design of the implant, the design of the superstructure on top of the implants, and the surface modifications of the implants. And in other words, we now use uh, sandblasted surfaces, acid etched surfaces, the rough, moderately rough surface implants. So that's what the problem is. You take a look at the superstructure, and we know we all have this issue. How does the patient keep this clean? I don't know. How can the patient keep this clean? This is a problem. And all of us know it's almost impossible for the patient to keep it clean and for us to get in there and maintain it when the patient comes into the office. Designs of superstructure can be problematic. And we're all aware of this. So, mucositis and peri-implantitis. The weak links of the surface and the implant abutment junction. The adhesions of microbes to bare and rough, implants, uh, rough implant threads impedes mechanical cleaning. So I happen to flap this back and take a look at the calculus and the threads of that implant. Now, again, our normal root planing motion is up and down. But with implants, 
that does nothing in those concave areas where the threads are. You have to go around each individual implant thread and debride and, and remove this particular calculus. And it's extremely hard to do, especially when the tissue is high and you can't see it. It's almost impossible. It's one of the things we have to deal with. The next issue we deal with is this implant abutment junction. Micro leakage occurs into and out of both internal hex implants and Morse taper implants. So what happens is every time the patient bites, at this particular implant abutment junction, bacteria migrates and pumps in and out of that implant abutment junction, which is more often than not right by the crest of bone. So in a patient that's susceptible to peri-implant disease, this really becomes problematic. Goal of treatment, surface decontamination, both mechanical and chemotherapeutic. Once you have a problem, mechanical therapy is not enough. And again, the research is, has confirmed this in multiple studies. The objective is, is to disrupt the bacterial plaque and biofilms that toxify the cell components affecting growth on the implant surface. Okay, so that's the endotoxin. So you can, yes, get rid of the bacteria itself, but the cell walls remain. You have to remove that also because that's the endotoxin. And also you want to reduce the bacterial load by dilution to a level that will allow healing, to a sub-inflammatory level. So microbiologic principles, it's dilute, the bacteria is another way that we can do this. And this is difficult to, me, me, to accomplish by mechanical means alone. And we know this to be a fact. So mechanical and therapeutic, these are all mechanisms and thing, different me modalities of therapy that people use to wind up decontaminating or detoxifying an implant surface. Curettes, ultrasonics, aerobraces, a profijet, lasers, titanium brushes, chlorhexidine, saline, every, I mean, you look in the research, these are all the things that are recommended. Citric acid, tetracycline, peroxide, essential oils, that's Listerine, okay? Triclosan, which is in Colgate, stannous fluoride, polishing cup and brush, it's local and systemic chemotherapeutics like arrestin and what have you, and photodynamic therapy. So, you know, which ones do we use? You know, and everybody has their own idea. And I think Marco Esposito said it really the best at this point in time. While there is no reliable evidence suggesting which is the most effective treatment for peri-implant disease, that doesn't mean that currently used treatments don't work to a greater or lesser extent. And what we're going to do now is we're going to try to give you some, some idea of how we approach ma maintaining these, these implants and give you some direction in terms of something simple that you can use in your practice and you can give your, your, to your hygienist to give to the patients. Let's talk a little about mechanical instrumentation. Curettes. Curettes are problematic. Reason curettes are problematic is they have to be softer than the implant and metal curettes will alter or scratch the implant surface. If you scratch the implant surface, you scratch the collar of the implant, which tends to be smoother, what happens is more bacteria can conceivably accumulate on the implant surface. It also damages the oxide layer, okay, and affects the surface chemically and biocompatibly, as I said, and surface roughness influences plaque growth. So what you want to use is the implant's titanium, so they now have titanium curettes. Same surface hardness, less apt to scratch an implant. Plastic curette, gold, gold is softer than titanium, so a gold-headed curette will work. And finally, carbon fiber plastic curettes will work. So these all can work in the patient's mouth. You don't want to use a stainless steel curette. Cavitrons, you don't want to use a cavitron tip and have a hygienist go in there and say, oh, just clean the implant with a cavitron. Okay? Sonic and ultrasonic staylers can cause considerable damage to implant surfaces. Now this is an SEM of a titanium implant that's been hit with a cavitron, just once or twice. That's what it causes. Think what happens when you multiply that by the thousands of times when you use cavitron to go in there and decontaminate an implant surface. So you're really scratching the implant surface. Damage to titanium oxide layer leads to a change in surface chemistry and biocompatibility. Fox 1990. Now, 
what they decided to do is, well, let's put a Teflon tip on the end of the cavitron to stop it, the metal, from hitting the implant surface, which was a good idea because there was no heat or surface damage when the Teflon tip was used. The problem was there was a plastic residue from the Teflon tip. And when you take a look here, as we're decontaminating this implant surface, you can see there are little shards of plastic coming off the tip of this, this Teflon tip that's on this cavitron. And then these shards of plastic will actually fall into the defect. And if you're not careful, they'll cause a foreign body reaction. And then you totally lose. So there are problems, and these Teflon tips are problematic. Good idea, but to be used with great caution or not used at all. Lasers. Now, lasers are really being marketed widely in dentistry today. And as I look at lasers, lasers are still, um, there's still um, a product technology that's looking for an adaptation and a place to use the technology. Lasers will decontaminate an implant surface. They will remove the bacteria. They do decrease bleeding upon probing. But depending upon whether they're pulsed uh, or how they're used or, or the wavelength of the laser and how fast it's used, heat from a laser can cause surface damage to the metal and can cause a change in the hydrophilicity of the implant surface. And you get hydrocarbons and carbonates on the surface of the implant, which prevent reintegration ultimately. So the answers needed about lasers, the most useful, ergag, CO2, diet, diode, NDAG, optimal power settings, wavelength, pulse, continuous effect on the implant surfaces, and the significance of the surface alter alterations caused by the lasers. So again, a technology looking for a usefulness at this point in time. But I really think lasers do have promise in dentistry, and it's just a matter of, of, of time before we find the best application of them. So, Error braces, mechanical treatment, error braces, air power, they can successfully decontaminate an implant surface. We know that to be the case. The research shows it. But there is an increased risk of air emphysema if you get into the tissue spaces. And sodium bicarbonate can cause microscopic alterations to the implant surface. Uh, Duarte's found no adverse effect with air, air polishing. So again, the research isn't particularly clear on this. I do know I've done some research myself on sodium bicarbonate and have looked at them under SEMs. And what essentially we see is that residual particles of sodium bicarbonate and calcium carbonate stay on the implant surface after you use the air abrasive. So I want to introduce you to this air abrasive. This is from the EMS systems. It's a Swiss company. It's called the Perioflow. And what they have is a little tip okay, that fits inside the, the implant, it's inside the sulcus around the implant itself or around the tooth, you can use this. And what it does is it winds up spraying glycine powder as opposed to sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate powder is about 65 microns on average, the particle size, whereas the glycine powder, and glycine is an amino acid, and this is glycine in a powder form, is only 25 microns in size. So it's a smaller particle size, and what happens is because it is an amino acid, it dissolves pretty much in saliva and body fluids and what have you. And the compressed air device is at a reduced pressure, so there's less of a chance of air emphysema. And the results are comparable to hand instruments, lasers, and, and photodynamic therapy. Again, as Esposito says, these will all work to a greater or lesser extent. Lower risk of air emphysema, and it does not seem to cause surface changes on the implant. So these can all be used. Hygienists like this implant, uh, this, this, uh, this airflow, because it's uh, in their comfort zone. So this is something that you may want to consider for them to use as a profi jet. It can be used, and it can also be used to get in around teeth, around pockets, as well as around implant surfaces. Uh, local delivery of antiseptics. And this is really important because we're going to incorporate this into how we recommend that you have your patients maintain their mouths when they have dental implants. Listerine triclosan, essential oils, Listerine mouthwash. Less plaque and bleeding upon probing than controls, and, but no change in pocket depths. And this is Ciancio in 1995. 
Listerine has been shown to be a very effective antiseptic. Second to chlorhexidine, the most effective antiseptic. Um, it has alcohol in it. The alcohols actually activate the essential oils. So if you're using Listerine and you use the Listerine and the patient can't have alcohol, better that you actually use Sepacol or Cetoporidium chloride, CPC, which is in Sepacol and it's also in, um, it's in Colgate, uh, anti-plaque mouth rinse, and that's what they're using at this point in time. So if no alcohol, that, if they can have the alcohol, Listerine has been shown to be more antibacterial than Sepacol. And this is something that patients know of and they use. No change in probing depth. And I want you to watch as we talk about these different medicaments in terms of how much change can be expected when we use these medications as far as the actual pocket depths are concerned. Triclosan dentifrice mouthwash. Inflammation reduced over six months. And there are two studies on this. Bleeding upon probing decreased from 54% to 29%. Well, that's good. Increase in the sodium fluoride controls. Now, sodium fluoride is the active ingredient in Crest. And I, for years, was a Crest guy, but I started looking at this and looking at this research, and it seems triclosan is a better ingredient than the sodium fluoride in Crest. So, increase in sodium fluoride in controls. Number of sites with five millimeter plus pocketing and bleeding and pocketing significantly reduced. Not so again in the controls. Less plaque, less bleeding upon probing, reduction in gram-negative anaerobes over a six-month period of time. And Colgate toothpaste is something that's readily available for the patient to use or for your patient to use on a day-to-day -day basis at home. So keep that in mind. Um, chlorhexidine. Let's talk a little bit about chlorhexidine. This is with subgingival irrigation of chlorhexidine. Clinical improvement over controls and pocket depth, clinical attachment levels and inflammation. Well, that's good. No additional benefits over mechanical debridement at 30 days after using it twice a day for 10 days, and this is on titanium plasma sprayed in HA implants, but no additional benefit at 30 days after using it for 10 days. Plus chlorhexidine stains the teeth. There are also some in vitro studies um, in, a, in a petri dish that shows chlorhexidine inhibits fibroblast proliferation. So in other words, regeneration of soft tissue or connective tissue in a, t in a test tube or in a petri dish is inhibited by chlorhexidine. Additionally, it's been also shown to inhibit, inhibit epithelial cells. So all of these things, though not definite contraindications, because in human beings it's never been shown, any of this, they are, it does make you a little bit suspect about using chlorhexidine. And in the early peri-implant research, when they were trying to get bone regeneration around implants with peri-implant disease, and this is Wenzel's research and Erickson's research back in the 1990s, they cleaned all of these implants with chlorhexidine, and while they got bone fill, they didn't get bone regeneration. In other words, the, the defect filled with bone, but the bone didn't attach to the implant surface. But interestingly enough, where it did attach, they put a new cover screw on top of the implant, and it did actually attach directly to the cover screw that hadn't been treated with chlorhexidine. So that's the reason that, yes, chlorhexidine works in a lot of research still like it. Nicholas Lang likes chlorhexidine and uses it and still talks about using it. I heard him speak recently, and, and he's still using chlorhexidine. But the question is, if we have something else that's less suspect, why not? And it also won't stain the patient's teeth because staining the patient's teeth is a problem. But chlorhexidine is widely used. What we also use is we also use, in our office, peroxide and water, all right? So we dilute peroxide 50-50. We take 3% peroxide and dilute it 50-50 with water, and we use that as an irrigate. Now, this will get rid of the anaerobes. What we start to see is the pocket depths get to be 5 millimeters, 6 millimeters, and what have you. That's conducive for anaerobes to wind up multiplying in those pockets. And the peroxide will kill the anaerobes. So what we do is we irrigate around the teeth and in the sulcus of all these teeth or with your implants with peroxide. Now, peroxide is quickly inactivated by salivary enzymes. 
So what I have the, the hygienist do when she irrigates, and we'll talk a bit more about this later, is she'll irrigate around the affected implant, go clean a quadrant of another quadrant of the patient's teeth, go back and irrigate again, clean another quadrant of the patient's teeth, irrigate again, another quadrant, and then you know, do the final quadrant and irrigate again. So during the course of the hour, you're irrigating about four or five times around that defect after she mechanically debrides it. Okay? Local delivery of antibiotics, theoretical advantages. Higher concentration delivered to the site, right at it, because it's local delivery. Reduced risk for adverse side effects. Reduced interaction with other drugs. Reduced risk of emerging antibiotic resistant strains. And not dependent upon patient compliance because you're putting it down there. And that's arrestin, is, is what we you know, one of the, the local antibiotics. Improvement in pocket depth, bleeding upon probing microbiology at six months, not 12 months. So again, you get six months maximum use out of this or efficacy, and then it decreases. And chlorhexidine gel was the control. So it was better than chlorhexidine, the arrestin. Improvement in the range of one millimeter as far as pocket depth is concerned. That's not a lot. That's not significant to me, one millimeter clinically. Tetracycline fibers, again, decreased gingival hypoprasia and bleeding upon probing. Tetracycline fibers, this with mucositis, with periimplantitis, improvement in pocket depth, bleeding index, anaerobic rods, rebound again, six to 12 months. Two of the 25 patients still had the purulence. Slowly re, slow release doxycycline, additional one millimeter, again, one millimeter pocket depth reduction and clinical attachment gain with doxycycline than mechanical. But one millimeter is not a lot clinically. It may be something statistically, but it's really not meaningful when I think about it clinically. So systemic antibiotics, the rationale of using systemic antibiotics is to reach an effect gram negative bacteria invading the peri-implant tissues because we see them actually in the tissues and prevent recolonization. And there's one study that really looks at this very closely back in uh, 2003. Uh, Leonard looked at nine patients and 26 machined implants for five years, okay, with three or more threads of, of bone loss, advanced bone loss. Open flap mechanical debridement, peroxide decontamination, sterilized and replaced the abutment antibiotics for two to four weeks, and then maintenance every th three to six months. And this is what he subsequently found using systemic. Bleeding upon probing plaque reduced from 100% to 5%. Well, that's good. Amino, uh, actinobacillus actinomycetic comedins reduced from 66% gram negatives to zero. Well, that's great. But take a look, and remember we spoke about implant-specific and patient-specific. He still, out of those 26 implants, he still lost seven of the 26 implants, but they were only lost in four patients, okay? Four of the nine patients, okay? Four of the remaining implants, okay, if you take from 26, you had 19 implants, four showed continuing bone loss of about a thread, nine showed no change, so we arrested the disease progress, and six actually gain bone. So he called it 58% successful. But the question basically is, is patients that are susceptible to peri-implant disease, once you have advanced peri-implant disease, it's very difficult in many of them to stop it from progressing and losing the implant. So once again, the rationale for catching this early. And recommendations, amoxicillin three times a day, 500 milligrams, Cipro in patient allergic, plus metronidazole, 500 milligrams, three times a day for seven days, all right? If you know you don't have AA, if you happen to culture your pockets and you don't have AA, you can use clindamycin, it works fine also. 300 milligrams, four times a day for seven days. Now cement, cement is a real problem, all right? Cement is a super real problem. If you take a look here, you can see there's a little fistulous track right where the cement is, Take a look at the amount of bone loss around this implant, and you take a look, this is this implant. Look at the cement in, on this implant surface. Now, Wadwani and Pinero uh, had a really good study. They actually mentioned about it, talk, spoke about it at the AAP annual meeting in 2012. They got to look at 185 failed implants, and they looked at them under a stereo microscope. And 65% of those 100, 185 failed implants showed ev evidence of excess cement when 
examined under magnification. Now that's huge. That's a huge, huge percentage. Um, cement removed from implant abutments, agar. Uh, zinc phosphate, glass isomer, and resin cement looked at the three. And what he found is using stainless steel explorers, gold-coated plastic scalers, what he found is clinicians left more cement than they thought. Instruments caused more scratching than expected, and the resin cement was the most difficult to use. This resin cement seems to be a problem. Take a look at Wilson and what he found in 2009. He looked at 48 implants with peri-implant disease under a, um, using a, actually using an endoscope. Okay, and what he showed is 81% of those 42 implants had residual cement visible endoscopically. And 75% of them showed resolution after, of inflammation after they removed the excess cement. And 80% of these affected implants were cemented with a resin cement. So resin cement seems to be most problematic. Premier implant cement, which is the most widely used implant cement today, okay, before 2011 was radiolucent. It wasn't even radio-opaque, so you couldn't even see it when you took an x-ray of it. This is a problem because what well, they surveyed, um, Tarika surveyed 62 dental schools, and what they found is resin-modified glass ionic cement was preferred in 70% of those schools. And again, the largest selling resin cement was radiolucent prior to November 2011, and that's Wadwani's research. So, how do you cement your crowns? Do you tell your assistant to fill them with cement? Half fill them? Or rim them with cement? When you're dealing with implants, very important, let me give you a hint. And if you're going to take this, as a great take home from this presentation. So how you cement your crowns is important. This is a cementing die. Now if you have a lab, what they can do is put a, 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 a dowel in acrylic, okay, harden it, and have them fabricate this so it fits the implant uh, inside of your, your, your crown, and put cement in the crown, put the cementing dye into the crown, it will express the excess cement, you wipe off the excess cement, and then take this crown and place it into the patient's mouth. If you don't have your own lab, put a little bit of a spacer, dye spacer, into the crown, put some blue mousse into the crown, and let it harden, and create your own dye, totally matches the dye of the crown, and this is the dye of the crown, and then put cement into the crown, put the blue mousse, okay, into the, put the, the blue mousse dye spacer um, into, the, into the crown, and express the excess cement, okay, wipe off the excess cement, and then re-cement the crown. And this can also be done with multiple teeth, same type of thing. So, Again, you don't want excess cement. If you're going to be using cement, zinc oxide eugenol or zinc oxide based cement is the best cement to use. It's been shown to be bacteriostatic and it's radio opaque. So you can wind up seeing it so you can get it out. But if you're using cement just a little bit and make these cases retrievable, you don't ever, ever, ever want to cement any of these, these cases permanently because you need retrievability and we'll show you why. Treatment of mucositis and peri-implantitis. Early interceptive treatment is imperative in the patient prone to peri-implant disease. And the best treatment for peri-implant disease in 2013 is prevention. So, let's talk about maintenance and how you're going to maintain these areas. Maintenance objectives. Disrupt colonization of the bacterial plaque biofilm. Dilute bacterial load to a level that will allow healing and detoxify the implant surface of the bacterial cell walls components with your goals being to eliminate bleeding upon probing, reduce pocketing, and stabilize the bone levels. Disrupt, dilute, and detoxify. Let's take a look at this case. Mucositis, a reversible inflammatory infiltrate in the soft tissues surrounding a functioning implant. That was the definition as we presented it previously. Clinical signs, inflammation, bleeding upon probing, four plus millimeter pocketing, separation, but no progressive bone loss. These are the clinical signs. So if you take a look here, you can see the inflammation around this implant supported. This is an implant restored crown. Inflammation, we're probing around it, and you can see 
the bleeding upon probing that's present as we probe around that implant and take a look at it. Separation without visible inflammation. And this is why it's important that you probe your cases and have your hygienist probe your cases. Okay? No bleeding, but you have to palpate around the implant because when you palpate around the implant, you can see the pus, the purulence coming up from that pocket where you have a, a six, seven millimeter pocket in this area, but no bleeding. So you have to check for suppuration. But the radiographs are stable, stable bone levels after one year of functional loading. No progressive bone loss past the first year. So this implant was put in in 2005. You can take a look. Here's the implant, here's the crown in place. In 2008, this is the amount of bone loss that we have. In 2011, still the same, stable amount of bone loss. As the biologic width forms, you lose a little bit of bone, which it did here, but it stayed stable. So no progressive bone loss, that indicates mucositis. Progressive bone loss indicates periimplantitis. So early diagnosis is imperative, imperative. And how you treat this is you use cumulative interceptive supportive therapy, or CYST. This was originally presented by Mombelli and Lang in 2000 and is still valid today. What they do cumulatively is you start with mechanical therapy, and then if need be, you add antiseptic therapy. If need be, you add antibiotic therapy. And then finally, you get to the point where you have surgical therapy. If you take a look at this chart, what it shows here is this is how you approach it. With pocket depth, three millimeters or less, an absence of plaque of bleeding upon probing, or the presence of plaque. Absence of plaque, they say no treatment, okay? Presence of plaque and bleeding upon probing, but three millimeter pockets or less, just mechanical debridement with your curette, soft curette, either a carbon fiber, plastic, titanium curette, gold curette, mechanical debridement with the curette, and just polish with a profi cup. And that's all you need, okay? When you get to four to five millimeter pocketing and you have bleeding upon probing, what you do is you do A, which is the mechanical debridement, and then you add the antiseptic cleaning, all right? And that can be, to me, in my office, that's when we use the peroxide. And we add the peroxide rinses, or peroxide irrigation, when we have antiseptic cleaning. That's what we use in this particular office. If you want to use chlorhexidine, that's fine. But those are the basic antiseptics that we have. The povidine iodine some people use, that's fine with me also. When we get to five millimeter pocketing and greater, take a radiograph, because we want to make sure this isn't progressing. We have bleeding upon probing and no bone loss. We do A and B, antiseptic cleaning and mechanical debridement. Five millimeter pocketing with bone loss, two millimeters or less. Then we add the local antibiotic therapy into the mix, which could be Arrestin, for instance. And you can use that. And most of you are comfortable with Arrestin and using it in your practice. So the hygienist mechanically debrides. You irrigate with the peroxide. And then you add Arrestin into the mix. If it's beating upon probing less than two millimeters, if you've tried that and it doesn't take care of the problem, then you may want to put antibiotic therapy into the mix and add that into it. If you continue to see bleeding upon probing and progressive bone loss, resective and regenerative therapy, I have a step in between that, and it's removing the superstructure if possible and detoxify further. I'll show you that as we move along into this. So in the non-periodontal patient, okay, mucositis treatment sequence, mechanical debridement, curette, air abrasive, ultrasonic with a te Teflon tip if you want, or laser, just to the point of resistance. When you probe, probe to the point of resistance. You don't want to go through any resistance or adherence that you may have. So you probe to the point of resistance and stop. Same thing when you curette, use the ear abrasive and the laser to the point of resistance. And then triclosan at home with the patient, with the Listerine, chlorhexidine, peroxide and water, irrigate into the sulcus, evaluate for improvement or into the pocket, evaluate for improvement in three months. No improvement to five millimeter pocketing, retreat treatment along with local minocycline, which is the arrestin, or remove the restoration and detoxify. And we'll talk about that. In a periodontal patient, and again, we have to be more aggressive, I think, with patients that have had prior periodontal disease. 
Stable perio mechanical and antiseptic treatment plus local minocycline, evaluate for improvement in three months. Active perio above protocol, but you have to treat the periodontal disease. I mean, you have to treat the periodontal disease. Then remove the restoration and detoxify. No improvement following treatment, systemic, systemic antibiotics, or surgery. No inflammation, no bleeding upon probing, no pus. Even though it's a six millimeter pocket, just polish it. Go in to bride with a curette and polish it, okay? If you have inflammation, remove the prosthesis if feasible. And that's why screw retained restorations or a restoration that's cement retained with, with temporary cement so you can get it off, okay? So you remove the prosthesis, you remove the plaque, and you steam clean this, you use a profi jet on it, or you sterilize it, and then you take actually a cotton pellet to remove the endotoxin in saline, and you go around the surface or the underside of this restoration in order to detoxify it. You curette, lightly curette, the, the inflamed area inside to get to bleeding. Okay, you want to remove the epithelium, you want to get to bleeding underneath, which is connective tissue. So you lightly curette the, the pocket lining, and then you detoxify the implant platform with peroxide. You irrigate it, you take a cotton pellet, saturate in peroxide, and you detoxify the platform of this implant. And also, put peroxide into the screw access opening to kill the bacteria that may be in this screw access opening. Remember we spoke about bacteria, about bacteria pumping in and out? There's bacteria in this screw access opening. And it's important you do everything you can do to detoxify it. If you make this a clean surface and you get down to connective tissue here and you detoxify this and you make everything a clean surface, what happens is you're looking for epithelium connective tissue readherence onto the implant. So this is what the original looked like and this is what we had at six months. Here we had seven millimeter pockety bleeding and inflammation. You take a look here, a little bit of bleeding, but this is different, this is different bleeding than this bleeding. This is bleeding because we've gone possibly too far laterally with the probe and we've wound up going in from, into the underlying connective tissue. But take a look at the tissue here and take a look at the tissue here. And that's what we're looking for. And that's the reason to get these off if you can't solve the problem with leaving them on. And yet there's a fee involved for this. You know, we have to explain to the patient, again, that there's sometimes there's a maintenance fee involved in this. In other words, implants can't be great and they never require any further treatment. Its implants are great, and most of the time they're wonderful and they're no problems, but on occasion people do have problems, especially patients with prior peri periodontal disease. And what we have to do in these situations, we may have to do some treatment and additional treatment and even take this off and clean it. And there should be a fee, and they should know way up front so that it's no surprise. We can't be, we can't be responsible for these things three, four, or five years out. Uh, take a look at this patient from our practice, okay? Here we're down about seven, eight millimeter pocket, uh, seven, eight millimeter probing depth. This patient really tried to keep her mouth clean. She was a very conscientious patient, but it was difficult. No bone loss, but we took this restoration off and look what was underneath. Look at that junk. Sitting right against this tissue, right against the bone. This is trouble waiting to happen. And that's why it's so important that we took this subsequently. Take a look. We have this off. Take a look what it looks like. This was healthy. Take a look at the sulcus here. This was inflamed. And that's why we had the pocket depth that we had here. And look at the inflammation. So we took this implant surface, and we took this, and we cleaned it, and we detoxified it. And if you take a look, it's a lot cleaner. Uh, when I looked at this, when I took the slides, I said, oh my god, I didn't clean it totally, and I thought I had but it's certainly a lot cleaner. We've moved most of the bacteria and the endotoxin. We put this back in the patient's mouth and we take a look one year at the one year follow-up and we can see there's still pocketing here. There's still five millimeter pocketing, but we've shrunk it from about eight or nine millimeters to five millimeters. The tissue is a lot healthier. There's no bleeding on probing. There's no inflammation. And the patient is able to keep it a lot cleaner at this point in time. 
because we have them on a maintenance regimen that we're going to talk about. Uh, with the crowns in place, sometimes you can't get these crowns off. But take a look. Look at all the inflammation. Uh, look at all the, the, the plaque and calculus along the surface of these crowns. And you take a look at this. What we did here is you wind up getting in with your Profijet and you wind up cleaning the surface of these implants and getting in and irrigating with the peroxide and that's how you maintain these surfaces. With the framework in place, this is very difficult to get around. How do we get around this to clean this for the patient? Very, very difficult. Look what we're pulling out of there when we go in with the curette. Look at all that plaque and debris. So we do as the best we can mechanically and it's unrealistic to think that we can do it completely mechanically because of that framework that's there. But uh, we do the best we can mechanically and then we get in with our peroxide and we keep doing it multiple times with the peroxide to decontaminate, get out the oxygenating you know, effect of it, gets out the bacteria and also kills the anaerobes and then we get in with arrestin and we use that and that's how we approach it. So maintenance protocol, and that's what we're going to talk about now, radiographs. When do I take radiographs? You need parallel images showing the threads with each, because each thread is about six tenths of a millimeter apart. Now we take uh, x-rays at final placement to establish a baseline, and then we'll take another radiograph one year post-load, and we don't want that bone loss to exceed two millimeters one year after we load it, and that's for the establishment of the biologic width. Then another year, two years post-load, post post-function, minimal additional bone loss. As Albrecht has said, two th tenths of a millimeter or no additional bone loss each year. And as a periodontist, I have my restorative dentist send a copy of all radiographs to me. And we wind up calling, comes a year, we have a file at the front desk, and those, my people at the front desk will call, my referring dentist people at the front desk, to make sure they take radiographs. I mean, I'd like to have these patients come back to see me, but many times these patients aren't periodontal patients, they're prescription surgery patients. Patients fracture a tooth, told I'm asked to take the tooth out, put an implant in, restore it. I do that, and they go back to the restorative dentist. They may come back once or twice, but they don't want to come back to me. They're, they're very comfortable in the restorative dentist's office. And that's fine, but you as a restorative dentist have to be aware of all of this and have to do what has to be done to prevent this from becoming more problematic. And that's where we're at. So that's the reason for the x-rays. We, in some cases, even use a, a jig. This is Duralay, and we put it on a, on a bite block um, for parallel, to take a parallel x-ray so that we can reproduce the same exact angle. And we'll do this with some of our patients at all times. We want the same exact angle. So maintenance protocol, okay? Home care regimen the first year. Optimal home care is imperative. We have our, patient, our patients brushing with the triclosan toothpaste, Colgate Total, twice a day, okay? We have them rinsing with Listerine, or you can have chlorhexidine if you want, but we have them rinsing with Listerine twice a day with one of those rinses being right before they go to sleep at night. The Listerine research shows that what you want to do to prevent biofilm from forming at night when you're asleep is to rinse with Listerine right before you go to sleep. If you don't want the patient to have an alcohol-based mouthwash, we'll use the, the Sepacol, the acetylperinium chloride, or the, the actually um, uh, Colgate use, has an anti-plaque mouth rinse that's also uh, CPC. So, with your Listerine or uh, uh, chlorhexidine, and use an end tough brush and interproximal brushes dipped in Listerine or di uh, dipped in Listerine or with Colgate toothpaste on it to get around the tooth to make sure you get to all the spots that you can possibly get around the tooth to keep it clean. In office regimen, first year, maximum recall, three months. Gentle probing for resistance. You have to probe these things, okay, to see where you stand. Evaluate plaque levels, profi cup and polish for three millimeters less with no bleeding upon probing. Debridement with curette and air abrasive at four to five millimeters and no bleeding upon probing. But after you do all of this, interceptive therapy if bleeding upon probing. So, treatment of mucositis and peri-implantitis. 
Early interceptive treatment is imperative in the patient prone to periodontal disease. The best treatment for peri-implant disease in 2013 is prevention. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to take some questions. And after those questions, what we're going to want, we're going to speak about is meaning, uh, minimizing peri-implant disease and optimizing implant cosmetics by maintaining crestal bone and soft tissue levels. We're going to talk about dual zone healing and maintaining, managing the biologic width to minimize crestal bone resorption and gingival recession to optimize cosmetics. Talking about surface to top topography, platform switch, micro threads, the Morse taper. And then after that, we're going to talk about surgical man management of peri-implantitis. So we're going to stop here. We're going to take some questions, and then we'll go on from there.